I'm coming. I'm just gonna come as hard as I can. Me? Yes. The, the same way it has felt in everything else I've done for the past 14 years, I am riding Brock Lesnar's coattails, and I'm riding it all the way to the bank. The big man, Brock Lesnar. Honestly, honestly, I was drunk and high. I couldn't even tell you what happened. All I know is when we got off the plane, we got reprimanded, and that's it. If you want to know the real truth. <laughs> Why? 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 I guess because I want to, that's why. Welcome to an extraordinary journey through the career of one of the most dominant figures in combat sports history, Brock Lesnar. A phenom in every sense of the word, Lesnar's journey from a NCAA Division I wrestling champion to the pinnacle of world wrestling entertainment, his conquests in New Japan Pro Wrestling and his undeniable dominance in the UFC have cemented his legacy as a true legend. Brock is one of a kind, he truly is. I love watching him. I always tell you that I watch the people. It's really difficult to ignore Brock. You're in for the fight of your life, but he's also the most giving, gracious performer. He gives it all, and there's no way for you to question his legitimacy. There's a ringside sign that says, Legitimacy has returned. That says it all when it comes to him. I love Brock. As a performer, he's truly underrated. Even though he is in that conversation of the greatest of all time, I love him as a human being. He is wholeheartedly himself and he shoots you straight. At least you know where you stand with him at all times and I really admire that about him. His brute strength, unparalleled athleticism and sheer determination led him to achieve feats many could only dream of, becoming the youngest WWE Champion of all time, conquering the UFC Heavyweight Championship and delivering unforgettable matches that have left fans in awe for decades. Brock's gone from being a great attraction, a good worker, to a great worker. He is a great worker right now, he's in a class of great, he can do anything and it looks real. I only wrestled him a couple of times and he used to say, remember I'm just a little bit older than you buddy, he never hurt me, Brock is like Bruiser Brody, Brock is pretty intimidating. But as we revel in the glory of Lesnar's remarkable achievements, we find ourselves at a pivotal moment where the narrative takes an unexpected turn. Behind the curtain of his seemingly untouchable legacy lies a storm of controversy and accusations that have rocked the foundations of both the WWE and the UFC worlds in 2024. From the heights of stardom to the depths of depravity, this video will delve deep into the downfall of Brock Lesnar, exploring the intricate web of allegations that have led to his recent shocking erasure from the annals of WWE. Join us as we uncover the truths the lies and the scandals that have surrounded one of the most polarizing figures in the history of sports entertainment. What led to such a dramatic fall from grace? How did accusations so severe come to light? And what has been the fallout to Lesnar, the organizations he once represented and the fans who adored him? And discover if the allegations against him deserve to see all of these accomplishments destroyed from the annals of sports entertainment history forever. It is said that due to his immense success and meteoric rise, Brock Lesnar had one hell of an ego. Many contemporaries have stated that if you were perceived to hold more power within the company than Brock, then he would show you the utmost respect and politeness. However, if Brock saw you as beneath him, then he could act spiteful, rude and aggressive. One such incident occurred in his early days with Ohio Valley Wrestling. Jim Cornette, a veteran of the wrestling industry, known for his outspoken personality and deep knowledge of the sport, was heavily involved in OVW, contributing as a booker and an on-screen talent. His wife, Stacey Cornette, known in the wrestling world as Sin, was also a part of the OVW roster, managing a faction that faced off against Lesnar and his team for a period. The incident in question revolves around allegations made by Sin against Brock Lesnar. She accused Lesnar of behaving inappropriately towards her, including an incident where Lesnar allegedly touched her without her consent. Furthermore, there were claims that Lesnar had deliberately hurt her during a wrestling spot, which is considered a serious breach of professional conduct in the wrestling industry. After all, wrestlers are trained to protect their opponents in the ring, and any deviation from this principle is met with severe criticism and repercussions, but not necessarily for Brock Lesnar. Brock and Shelton were working with the Disciples of Sin, and my lovely wife, who was Sin, managed a stable consisting of Damien, Slash, and Pain. 
They were veterans who could work with these young greenhorns and hopefully teach them timing and something in the ring. Stacy had just had certain parts of her anatomy pierced, and these certain parts would be where Brock's right hand went when he picked her up for the press slam. So you can do your own math on that. She told Brock earlier in the day, Hey, when you give me the press slam, watch out. Take care of the nether regions down there, because I just had this piercing done. So what happens? When you know who won the pony, he goes and gives her the press slam, and he clamps down and squeezes with his right hand. Now, she's got an incredible tolerance for pain. The situation escalated when Jim Cornette confronted Lesnar, leading to a heated altercation. Cornette, fiercely protective of his wife and known for his temper, did not take the allegations lightly. The fallout from the incident was significant. It put a spotlight on the challenges of maintaining professionalism and safety in a business that often blurs the lines between reality and scripted entertainment. The wrestling industry, especially in the developmental territories, is no stranger to intense physicality and sometimes questionable conduct. However, allegations of inappropriate behaviour and internal harm are taken seriously, given the potential for real-world legal and reputational consequences. That's where I had to say, look, you need to know this now. Don't say F you to her in front of me, because I won't fight you, I'll shoot you. Here's what he didn't realise, because he had been protected and pampered and made over for so long. Nobody is going to fight Brock Lesnar if he mouths off and runs his dick liquor about people or two people or whatever the F nobody is going to fight him. They're just going to pull out a firearm and shoot him. Would you fight Brock Lesnar? No, he's a beast. He's a goddamn genetic freak and nobody's going to fight him. Some of the duels I've seen, the guys are beaten before the duels even start. Even some of the top ranked guys, they're beaten before they even go out there. Terry Runnels, another WWE star around the time of Brock's ascension, accused Brock Lesnar of exposing himself to her in a disrespectful and inappropriate manner. According to Runnels, the incident took place in a behind-the-scenes setting, away from the public eye and the wrestling ring. This kind of behaviour, if true, would be considered highly unprofessional and a violation of personal boundaries and workplace ethics. Brock was very new to the business and he exposed himself to me at the insurrection pay-per-view like a real dick. The wrestling industry has faced numerous challenges over the years related to the allegations of misconduct, harassment and inappropriate behaviour. The entertainment nature of the business, combined with the physical closeness required by wrestling performers, creates an environment where boundaries can be easily crossed. In response, WWE have taken steps to improve their policies on conduct, harassment and the overall treatment of performers and staff. I remember that night I was doing interviews, I was backstage and I hear my name being called, and Brock was in the room. Dustin was in the room, my ex-husband at the time, and Brock did the whole thing. I know sold it, went to my dressing room. Dustin came and he's like, don't sell it. I'm like, I'm not selling it, I didn't sell it, I'm not gonna. In other words, let it lie, leave it alone. I wasn't ready for what McMahon had put on my plate. I couldn't eat it all. I tried to, you know, that's just me being, are you ready for this? And I just said, bring it on, let's go. I wasn't ready to be travelling 300 days a year, I wasn't ready to be a husband, I wasn't ready for a lot of things, I had a lot of growing up to do, I was forced to grow up. Now at this point, I'm bartering. I show you, you show me. The rest of the story, you figure it out. I was in the back, I was trying to keep cool, I kept looking up, looking <laughs> up. and the fight broke out, I was like, fuck that, I'm not even touching that thing. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Joe! But, um, yeah, no, the, the plane ride from hell. Get down! Stay down! Uh, a plane filled with alcoholic wrestlers. Now, without further ado, sit back, relax, and prepare for takeoff. By the turn of the millennium, the World Wrestling Federation had become the single monopoly within the grappling universe. Absorbing their competitors in WCW and a buyout of ECW later, and Vince McMahon was at the helm of the single largest entity that the pro wrestling industry had ever witnessed. Following their success during the Attitude Era and victory in the fabled Monday Night War, this wrestling behemoth was still exploding in popularity. With these new heights of success and swathes of growing fan bases around the world meant that the already gruelling travel schedule within WWF was about to become even more brutal. 
Vincent McMahon wanted to continue his world conquest, and part of his plan was to send out his roster of talented men and women to perform in other countries and attract even more viewers. This meant more money for the company, more shows would mean more ticket sales, more advertising revenue and more profit for shareholders. However, this more demanding travel schedule would also mean that the performers would be more tired, more worn down and possibly more reliant on stimulants and depressants to help maintain their schedule and energy. Pair all of these ups and downs with the idea that wrestlers would now be on the road or in the air for a huge portion of their lives and you have a concoction for disaster. A mix of tired, injured and depressed men and women who, by the very nature of their jobs as entertainers, have more fragile and larger than life egos, crammed into a small plane with nothing but long stretches of nothingness and unlimited supplies of alcohol and drugs ahead of them. What could possibly go wrong? I want you to zoom in on my face one time. Get a close up of this. Because this is a line that's been heard around the world. I'm the guy who took down Brock Lesnar at 35,000 feet. Mr. Perfect, whose real name was Kurt Hennig, was a part of the rambunctious atmosphere on the plane and had consumed his fair share of beers before the flight had even departed. He wasn't drunk at this stage, simply a little giddy and feeling that mischievous swell as the bubbles hit his belly. Grabbing a can of shaving foam from his hand luggage, Hennig began sneaking between the seats to the muffled sniggers of onlookers and secretly squirting small piles of the foam atop unsuspecting wrestlers' heads. One victim happened to be a young Brock Lesnar, whom didn't play into the joke half as well as his friend Hennig had hoped. Lesnar snatched at the foam can and knocked Hennig's hand, spilling alcohol over both men. This is when things erupted. But, you know, Kurt and fucking Brock got the tussle on and went into the emergency door, which obviously, like, they made a huge deal out of it. Brock Lesnar is a terrifying physical specimen. Mr. Perfect was physically at the time, well, perfect. Both men from Minnesota had an elite body, but also an elite mindset which, through sheer determination and competitiveness, allowed them to progress to the top of their chosen field of endeavour. They had always had a friendly rivalry, the two both seeming to understand how similar they were. When the two had imbued a little too much of Grandma's old cough medicine, that friendship momentarily buckled under the weight of the two grappling gods' competitive natures as, supposedly, did the device which keeps the emergency doors locked when the plane is in the air. So we're left with clearly conflicting accounts, all of which, once the plane had landed, made their way back to Vince McMahon and Jim Ross, who reacted angrily to the whole affair. Kurt Hennig, industry veteran, was marched quickly into the head office and told that the WWE found his physical behaviour on the flight unacceptable and believed that Hennig, through his drunken negligence, could have possibly endangered the lives of those on board with him. He was then informed that his contract would be terminated and told to pack his bags and leave. Now, I personally don't believe that there was ever a chance that the emergency latch could have been activated and the plane door flew open. That isn't how any of that works. The fight on board, depending on how vigorous and violent it truly played out, doesn't even seem to be that big of a deal, especially compared to some of the other antics which were taking place on the same trip. Perhaps Hennig simply drew the short straw, and WWE needed to be seen to take action on the roster which had wreaked so much havoc. Brock remained unpunished, and only a small selection of other wrestlers' contracts were terminated around the same time. Brock Lesnar is married to the former WWE superstar, Rena Lesnar. Rena, known as Sable during her time in WWF and Playboy, had a brief but impactful time on our screens in the late 1990s and early 2000s. It was during this time where both worked for Vince McMahon that they met around 2003. Lesnar and Sable have been married since 2006. He wrote in his 2011 memoir, I don't think my wife has ever regretted saying yes. I can tell you, I've never regretted it for a single moment. 
we were meant to be together. However, with seemingly all aspects of Lesnar's life, his early relationship with Sable was far from ordinary. In his book, Lesnar would mention about an instance when he sneaked inside of Sable's house to sort things out with her after having an argument. He wrote that when he was about to break in, he saw a neighbour who knew them to be a couple and assisted him with a screwdriver. I used the screwdriver he loaned me to get into one of her sliding doors, and of course the alarm goes off as soon as I get into the house. I knew the passcode, so I shut off the alarm, and now I'm inside. However, he would then return to the neighbour's screwdriver, bring all of his stuff in, and then wait. After Sable came to know about Lesnar's acts, she was infuriated. The Beast Incarnate further stated that when he broke into her house, he was sure that she was not out of town, and decided on waiting there. However, after waiting for a long time and calling from his cell phone, he had another idea. The former WWE champion called Sable from her landline. However, Sable would pick up the phone and get agitated. When the 45-year-old revealed that he was calling from her house, Sable was in shock. She yelled, you better not be at my house. However, Lesnar would calmly state that he was indeed in her house and would wait for her till she comes home. After Sable arrived, the two reconciled their issues and would carry on to be married until the current day. I remember he was very talented. <laughs> you he know, was, for a kid man. with one leg, he could do just about anything. Zach Gowan, WWE's first one-legged wrestler, brought an inspiring real-life backstory of overcoming childhood cancer and a subsequent leg amputation to the wrestling world. His storyline feud with Brock Lesnar, a top villain in WWE, drew mixed reaction due to the sensitive nature of Gowan's disability. Critics saw the feud, which featured Lesnar bullying and overpowering Gowan, as exploitative and uncomfortable, highlighting a significant power disparity. Particularly contentious was a segment where Lesnar assaulted Gowan, throwing him down the stairs, which many viewed as insensitive. Conversely, the storyline was also praised for showcasing Gowan's resilience and determination. Gowan's athletic performance in the ring, marked by high-flying moves and wrestling prowess, offered inspiration. His character was celebrated for not being defined by his disability, serving as a beacon of hope for individuals facing their own battles. Off-screen, the relationship between Gowan and Lesnar contrasted sharply with their on-air rivalry. He was a very mean man to me on camera, and he was a very sweet man to me off-camera, very genuine. There's no ulterior motives and there's no salesman -y type of, hey, I'll shake your hand here and then stab you in the back later. Zach Gowan famously had a brutal match with Brock Lesnar on WWE SmackDown in 2003, which saw Gowan get brutalised by the Beast in his home state of Michigan. As I get there to SmackDown, they tell me the idea of me and Brock, which I'm really ecstatic about because I'm like, I know we can do something really, really special here, I know it. All the pieces are there, and we put the match together, and it's one of the most violent matches in WWE history. It was only 5-6 minutes long, they needed Brock to be hated, and creative thought to themselves, how can we get Brock hated? Like you said, beat up the local kid with one leg in front of his mum, bloody mess. That was the first time I ever bladed in my life, was Smackdown, which is why it's a lot. It wasn't supposed to be that much, but I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Anyway, not something you'll ever see WWE do again. The gowan lesnar rivalry thus serves as a multifaceted story in WWE history. On one hand, it sparked debate over the ethics of using a real-life disability as a central element in a wrestling storyline. On the other, it showcased Gowan's determination and Lesnar's behind-the-scenes mentorship, highlighting themes of perseverance and a complex nature of character portrayal in professional wrestling. On one moment between Brock Lesnar and Zach Gowan that never actually happened. So the wheelchair spot that wasn't a wheelchair spot to begin with, the original idea was for Brock Lesnar to F5 me off the SmackDown fist through the stage. That was the original idea. Do you remember the SmackDown fist? So we were going to be on top of the SmackDown fist, Brock Lesnar was going to toss me off this bad boy, and I was going to go through the stage. And that was the plan for like two or three weeks. We had to pivot to the wheelchair spot down the stairs because creative, we couldn't figure out a plausible way for me and Brock Lesnar to be. A reason for us to be up on top of the fist. Like, how do we get up there? Did he drag me up there? Did he climb up? Is there a secret ladder? Like, we couldn't figure that part out. I'm coming. I'm just going to come as hard as I can. Another controversial moment happened for Brock, as he perhaps showed why he prefers to keep his mouth shut and avoid public interviews at all costs. In 2008, when speaking to a journalist, the mood during the discussion quickly turned sour when Brock took offence to some casual ribbing from one of the journalist's assistants. 
in what was reported as a tongue-in-cheek manner in in a way that was fitting with the casually homophobic tones of 2008. The assistant had joked about Lesnar potentially being gay. Here is how the journalist reports the event as they unfolded. Yeah, the former pro wrestler said, his voice growing louder, his eyes getting bigger. Well, you tell that, expletive. To print what Brock Lesnar said might make even John Rucker blush, but after his curse-laden outburst, he turned to a nearby reporter and explained, I don't like gays. Write that down in your little notebook. I don't like gays. The rivalry between Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle leading up to a WrestleMania 19 stands as one of the most intense and physically demanding narratives in WWE history. This period was characterised by Lesnar's relentless pursuit of the WWE belt, a journey marked by determination, resilience and ultimately a harrowing moment that could have had dire consequences. The culmination of their feud at WrestleMania 19 is remembered not only for the incredible athleticism displayed by both athletes, but also for a chilling accident that underscored the risks involved in WWE and the wider world of professional wrestling. Brock was special. Not only was he a great amateur wrestler, but this guy was the most powerful, quickest person I've ever met for his size. Strongest, smartest, just overall best wrestler I've ever seen. It didn't matter where Brock went, he was going to succeed no matter what. It didn't matter what sport you put him in, basketball, you put him in football, you put him in soccer, doesn't matter, he's going to excel, he's going to be at the top, he's going to be the best at whatever he does, that's how good Brock Lesnar is. The road to WrestleMania 19 was paved with Lesnar's unwavering focus on reclaiming the WWE Championship, having been betrayed by his then ally Paul Heyman and losing the title to Big Show at Survivor Series, Lesnar was on a quest for redemption. His victory at the Royal Rumble granted him a title shot at WrestleMania, setting the stage for a showdown with the Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle. Kurt was no stranger to high-stakes competition, but both he and Lesnar entered their WrestleMania match with significant physical ailments. The intensity of their rivalry was palpable when the night came, with each athlete striving to outdo the other and claim the WWE's top belt. However, it was the match's climax that left an indelible mark on the memories of those who witnessed it. In an attempt to deliver a spectacular finish, Lesnar performed a shooting star press, a high-risk aerial manoeuvre he had executed almost flawlessly in the past during his time in OVW. Tragically, the move went awry, and Lesnar landed on his head and neck, suffering a severe concussion. The moment was shocking, as fans and fellow wrestlers alike held their breath, fearing the worst. Despite the gravity of the injury, both Lesnar and Angle demonstrated remarkable professionalism and courage. They improvised the finish of the match, with Lesnar managing to complete the contest and secure his second WWE Championship. The victory was bittersweet, marred by the accident and the potential long-term implications for Lesnar's health. Lesnar's bot shooting star press at WrestleMania 19 is a stark reminder of the physical risks inherent in professional wrestling. It highlights the athlete's commitment to entertaining the audience, often at great personal risk. For Lesnar, the incident was a pivotal moment in his career, and one that would see him never attempt the shooting star press ever again. That was foolish on my behalf. You get people, producers, and people higher up in the company, they always want this WrestleMania moment, which would be fantastic. So I would practice it the night before. I was doing it in OVW when I was being trained. I'm 310 pounds, 6 foot 3, doing a front backflip off the top rope, hitting guys and winning matches. Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning, bless his soul, he said, you don't need to do that, stop doing that. It got to the point that I remember one day looking across the locker room at Ric Flair, who was then in his mid-fifties, and saying to myself, that's not going to be me. I wondered how many of his own kids' birthday parties did Flair miss. How many of their graduations? I didn't want to be pushing 60 years old and still wearing tights. In early June, McMahon did a two-part interview with Off The Record on TSN in Canada. McMahon told host Michael Landsberg that the problem with Lesnar wasn't that he didn't like the schedule, but that he wasn't very good around other people. McMahon said that Lesnar was an introvert and that he was a problem the WWE had with several wrestlers who had come up from amateur wrestling. McMahon said Lesnar's decision to leave was wild and took him by surprise. He added that Lesnar's decision hurt the company. Brock Lesnar's first exit from WWE in 2004 concluded a significant yet complex phase of his wrestling career, highlighted by memorable rivalries and personal challenges. 
His journey towards departure unfolded at No Way Out in February, where he lost the WWE belt to Eddie Guerrero after Goldberg's interference. This loss marked the beginning of Lesnar's feud with Goldberg. The match between Brock Lesnar and Goldberg at WrestleMania 20, with Stone Cold Steve Austin as the special guest referee, was one of the most highly anticipated matches in the company's history, yet it ultimately failed to meet the lofty expectations of fans and critics alike. This encounter was built upon a foundation of intense rivalry and the involvement of three of the most iconic figures in the wrestling world. However, despite these promises, the match is often remembered for its underwhelming performance and the negative reception it received from the audience in attendance at Madison Square Garden on March the 14th, 2004. Goldberg, who had made his name in WCW as an unstoppable force with a record-setting undefeated streak, had come to WWE with much fanfare. His brute strength, intensity, and no-nonsense attitude had made him a fan favourite. The inclusion of Stone Cold Steve Austin, one of the most popular and rebellious figures in the company's history as the special guest referee, added an extra layer of intrigue and unpredictability to the match. The rivalry between Lesnar and Goldberg was carefully constructed over several months, with both men interfering in each other's matches and confrontations that hinted at the inevitable showdown. Meanwhile, Austin's role as a special guest referee was seen as a wildcard factor, given his history of defiance and unpredictability. The match was highly anticipated for several reasons. First, it was a dream match between two imposing wrestlers from two different eras. Lesnar representing the new blood of WWE in the ruthless aggression era that was about to start, and Goldberg being a remnant of WCW's glory days. Fans were eager to see who would come out on top in a battle of sheer power and athleticism. However, before the match, it's said behind the scenes that Vince McMahon could not decide who would be the ultimate winner. If you're presented with that scenario and you're Vince McMahon, what the hell do you do? Who do you let win? Who do you hate less? I just wonder how he came to that decision, I really do, because it's like he wanted to kill me, and I know he wanted to kill Brock, so I guess he wanted to kill Brock even more, so that's why I beat him. Which, thank God, because I don't think they ever would have brought me back 13 years afterwards. However, the match failed to live up to expectations for several reasons. Firstly, the crowd at Madison Square Garden turned on the bout before it even began. News had leaked that both Lesnar and Goldberg were leaving WWE straight after WrestleMania, Lesnar to pursue a career in the NFL and Goldberg at the end of his one-year contract. This knowledge led to a hostile reception from the fans who felt betrayed by the impending departures of both superstars. Several days after the event, Alex Mares wrote in the Fort Lauderdale, Florida Sun Sentinel that word of Lesnar's departure leaked before Sunday's WrestleMania 20 match against Bill Goldberg, resulting in a brutal crowd reaction for both in their last scheduled WWE performances. Fans at New York City's Madison Square Garden taunted Lesnar and Goldberg and even started a chant for Hulk Hogan, who wasn't at WrestleMania 20 because of last summer's real life falling out with WWE owner Vince McMahon. They were dead. The jury had already declared their verdict before the trial had started. We're done. I felt bad for those guys, I really did. I signed Brock. I helped sign Goldberg. I liked both guys for various reasons. They both had a lot of similar characteristics as far as physicality. I'll tell you that for as good an athlete as Goldberg was, he wasn't in Lesnar's league in terms of being a pure athlete. The match itself was lacklustre and devoid of the intensity and physicality that was promised. Instead of a fast-paced, hard-hitting affair, the match was slow and filled with long periods of inaction as both wrestlers seemed hesitant to engage with one another. The crowd's disinterest turned to outright hostility with chants of boring and other derogatory remarks filling the arena. Finally, the involvement of Stone Cold Steve Austin, while initially seen as a potential highlight, did little to salvage the match. Although Austin delivered stunners to both Lesnar and Goldberg after the fight, this post-match action was seemingly too little, too late to win back the crowd's favour. Angle risked permanent injury and paralysis to face Lesnar in the main event of WrestleMania 19. Lesnar pouted about travel schedules and booking plans and put himself before the company in announcing his resignation less than a week before WrestleMania 20. That's a study of two opposites, a man the fans might remember as the Ric Flair of his day, and a man who used wrestling to leverage a career in the NFL. If he has indeed wrestled his last match, history probably will not remember Lesnar fondly, but that's one big if. 
In a nutshell, a spate of injuries, WWE's demanding performance schedule, which limited his time at home with his young daughter, and the general chaos of professional wrestlers' existence took their toll on Lesnar, who checked out immediately after his disappointing match with Goldberg at WrestleMania 20. He didn't even stick around for any of the event's after parties. Also, Lesnar's somewhat aloof personality, he had been travelling on his recently purchased private jet by the end of his tenure, made him a less than popular guy backstage. The cumulative effect of these factors on his body and mind was enough to send Lesnar, who didn't grow up loving pro wrestling but loved the money he made doing it, packing. A derisive and vocal reception by fans at WrestleMania 20 after they had caught wind of his imminent departure most likely cemented what must have been a somewhat difficult decision to walk away and leave so much WWE money on the table. Leading up to WrestleMania, speculation had begun to grow about Lesnar's departure, especially after his final WWE televised match against Hardcore Holly on March the 4th. The announcement of Lesnar leaving WWE to pursue an NFL career surprised many, casting a shadow over his WrestleMania bout against Goldberg. Lesnar's decision to leave the company was driven by a combination of burnout, injuries, dissatisfaction with the creative direction, struggles with alcohol and painkillers, and the demanding travel schedule. His tenure from debut to 2004 was marked by significant achievements and notable rivalries, but also by personal and professional challenges. Despite the tumultuous end, Lesnar's impact on WWE at this time was undeniable, setting the foundation for his eventual return and continued influence on the industry. In its WrestleMania 20 preview, Figure 4 Weekly said, Goldberg hasn't re-signed a new deal yet, so the chances of him winning this one are about zero. Stranger things have happened, and it should be noted that Brock has been very unhappy lately, because he was told the plans down the road were for The Undertaker to destroy him to get his new persona over again. This is one of those matches that most people would say doesn't look good on paper, however, I think it will be the big surprise of the show. Brock is the best big man ever in wrestling, and Goldberg is way better than a lot of people give him credit for being. I think he'll be a professional here, even though it's his last match with the company, and try to put on a great show, so this could end up being the sleeper match of the evening. In the years since, Lesnar has come out and said that he believes the reason that the information about his departure leaked because he wrongfully confided in Kurt Angle. Believing I could trust Kurt, I told him I was thinking of getting out of the business. I didn't tell anyone else, and he said he wouldn't either, but soon after I confided in him, I became convinced that Vince knew I was planning to leave. Did Kurt stooge me out? Lesnar's decision to split from WWE came at a bad time for the company. Kurt Angle's in-ring career is in jeopardy due to his recurring neck problems. Goldberg opted not to renew his contract. The Rock and Mick Foley are only working part-time schedules. Brock Lesnar's wrestling career took a significant turn following his initial departure from American football, marked by a controversial no-compete clause that he had agreed to as part of his release within WWE. This clause effectively barred him from participating in any professional wrestling activities outside of WWE for six years until June 2010 a restriction that Lesnar would eventually challenge in a legal battle that highlighted the complexities of wrestling contracts and the careers of high-profile athletes. I missed the NFL by an inch, IRS problems, no money coming in, and not that many options left because I signed that stupid no-compete clause with WWE. I had no one to blame but myself. In a bold move that underscored his defiance against the restrictive clause, Lesnar made an appearance at New Japan Pro Wrestling at an event in 2004, a decision that quickly drew legal fire from WWE. The company responded with a counterclaim, accusing Lesnar of breaching the agreement and igniting a legal struggle that would span several months. This legal tussle cast a shadow over Lesnar's aspirations in the wrestling world, particularly his efforts to expand his career in Japan. The dispute reached a critical juncture in July of 2005 when both parties decided to drop their claims and engage in negotiations, hinting at a possible reconciliation or a new agreement that would allow Lesnar to resume his wrestling career without constraint. However, negotiations seemed to falter as WWE announced in August that Lesnar has decided to cease any involvement with the company, leaving his career in limbo and the wrestling community in speculation about his future. The lawsuit eventually moved towards settlement talks, indicating a possible resolution to the impasse. On January the 14th, 2006, 
the case took a decisive turn when Judge Christopher Droney suggested he was inclined to rule in favour of Lesnar, pending a convincing argument from WWE. This development hinted at the potential for Lesnar to resume his wrestling career without the looming threat of WWE's legal repercussions. Vince McMahon managed to secure a deadline extension, but the continued legal battle underscored the intensity of the dispute and the significant implications for Lesnar's career. Finally, on April the 24th, 2006, both parties reached a settlement, culminating in the dismissal of the case by a federal judge at the mutual request of both legal teams. This resolution removed the legal barriers that had prevented Lesnar from wrestling outside of WWE, opening the door for him to explore opportunities in Japan and elsewhere without the threat of legal action. The incident following the Extreme Rules pay-per-view event in 2012, where Brock Lesnar faced John Cena, is a noteworthy episode in his story, illustrating the tensions that can arise backstage when creative decisions do not align with the performer's expectations. The match itself was highly anticipated, and delivered on its promise of being an exceptional showcase of both physical and mental storytelling. However, the aftermath revealed a discord between the planned narrative and its execution, leading to a significant backstage confrontation involving Brock Lesnar. When Lesnar was given the finish, he was told he was being protected because he was destroying Cena, that Cena would get the win, collapse, and have to be helped out of the ring and left for dead. Instead, Cena did a weird promo that, based on what we were told, he was not authorised to do. Everyone backstage, including Vince McMahon, either had no idea what he was doing and it was not in the script for the show, or maybe Vince knew and was pretending, but given how it turned out, I'd bet on the former. At the heart of this controversy was the creative decision surrounding the match's conclusion. Originally, Cena, despite emerging victorious, was supposed to appear utterly decimated, to the extent that he would require medical personnel to carry him out and transport him away in an ambulance. This outcome was intended to emphasise the severity of Lesnar's assault, thereby maintaining Lesnar's fearsome reputation even in the face of defeat. Such a portrayal would have illustrated the extreme lengths to which Cena had to go to secure a win, emphasising the brutality of Lesnar's onslaught and cementing him as a formidable force within the WWE narrative. However, this creative direction was ultimately not followed. Instead, Cena quickly recovered from the bout, addressing the audience with a promotional speech that starkly contrasted with the physically taxing match that had just transpired. This departure from the original plan not only diluted the intended impact of Lesnar's dominance, but also contradicted the narrative logic that had been established leading up to and during the bout. Lesnar's response to this deviation was one of palpable frustration, feeling that the revised ending undermined the efforts and storytelling both he and Cena had invested in the match. Lesnar expressed his discontent in a vehement backstage outburst. His actions, characterised by a physical demonstration of anger, including the disruption of furniture and confrontational interactions with WWE officials, reflected the depth of his dissatisfaction with the situation. Others have said both Cena and Lesnar were knocked silly from stiffing each other in the match, and Cena's weird promo may have been because he was on autopilot by that point in time from all the shots to the head during the match. Confrontation escalated to the point where intervention became necessary, and it was Triple H who stepped in to mediate the situation. He reportedly engaged Lesnar in dialogue aimed at calming the agitated superstar. While Triple H's intervention was pivotal in managing the immediate fallout, the incident underscored the complexities of performer satisfaction, creative control and narrative coherence within the world of professional wrestling. The event at SummerSlam in 2016 between Brock Lesnar and Randy Orton is etched in the annals of WWE history, not just for the brutal in-ring action, but also for the dramatic backstage confrontation it sparked. During the high-profile match, Lesnar delivered a series of stiff punches and elbows to Orton's forehead, a move that was scripted but shockingly violent in its execution. The result was a genuinely disturbing scene. I thought the finish of that match was very brutal and very violent. I didn't know if Randy was okay, and I was checking on Randy, my friend. This confrontation was not part of any storyline. It was a genuine reaction from Jericho, driven by concern for his colleague, and perhaps by a sense of justice or protection that transcends the boundaries of scripted sports. Jericho's approach to Lesnar was not just a bold move. It was bordering on the reckless, given Lesnar's formidable reputation both in and out of the wrestling ring. 
to confront someone of Lesnar's physical calibre, especially in the heat of the moment, speaks volumes of Jericho's character, showcasing a blend of bravery and impulsiveness that is rarely seen in the highly controlled environment of pro wrestling. Randy and I have always been pretty close. You know, I said something, and Lesnar said something, and the next thing you know, we're nose to nose yelling at each other. The tension escalated quickly, with Jericho and Lesnar going face to face, a physical standoff that seemed on the verge of exploding into a real altercation. The situation was fraught with potential for a physical clash that could have had serious repercussions, both personally for the wrestlers involved and professionally for the company. It was a moment where the lines between professional and personal grievances blurred, threatening to spill over into unscripted violence. It took the intervention of nearby WWE agents and Vince McMahon himself to defuse the situation. McMahon's involvement underscores the seriousness of the incident. It's not often that the WWE chairman has to step in to separate his performers backstage. Listen, let's make no bones about this. Brock is a trained fighter and he's a beast, but I'm not the type of person to back down from anybody. I'm glad he didn't eat me. And it just goes to show how these wrestlers with their egos and their careers to think about, especially someone at the very pinnacle like Brock Lesnar, is always blurring the lines in his head between what happens on the screen and what happens behind the curtain. Vince wanted to bully me like he does everyone else, because most people who end up on the outs with Vince McMahon don't have a pot to piss in. They have to crawl back on their hands and knees, begging for scraps. Well, let's get one thing clear. Brock Lesnar does what Brock Lesnar wants to do. Brock Lesnar's sporadic appearances on WWE programming, particularly during 2015, present an intriguing study into the management of a superstar's brand within the realm of pro wrestling. The decision largely attributed to WWE chairman at the time Vince McMahon to limit Lesnar's presence was rooted in the desire to cultivate a sense of exclusivity and specialness around the athlete, akin to the anticipation and rarity associated with marquee events. However, this approach was not without its detractors. A considerable segment of the WWE fanbase expressed frustration over Lesnar's limited appearances, feeling deprived of the opportunity to see one of the industry's top talents perform more regularly. Fans took to social media and various forums to voice their discontent, highlighting a growing disconnect between the company's strategic objectives and the expectations of its audience. The sentiment was that while Lesnar's appearances were indeed special, the infrequency of these occasions, especially while he held the WWE belt, left fans feeling shortchanged, particularly those who followed the weekly episodic nature of WWE programming closely. The essence of the issue lies in the wrestling industry's age-old debate of quality versus quantity. By choosing to market Brock Lesnar as a rare attraction, WWE aimed to enhance the perceived value of his matches, positioning them as must-see events. This tactic undoubtedly created moments of heightened anticipation and excitement amongst the audience, contributing to the spectacle and grandeur of professional wrestling. However, it also sparked a discourse on fan engagement and the role of a wrestling promotion in meeting its audience's desires for consistent entertainment. I don't think he gets the credit he deserves. He's such an amazing and talented worker. He has figured out this business to the core, from his facial expressions to his physicality to his selling. He gets it. Most importantly, he understands his role depending on where he's put. He has such awareness and that's the person he is. When you first sat down with Brock, did you ask him about steroids? You're just so big and you come out of the world that's of pro it. wrestling. <laughs> We're done. Thanks, guys. In 2016, Brock Lesnar found himself embroiled in a controversy that tested the boundaries of his dual contracts with both the UFC and WWE. The situation arose when Lesnar failed two drug tests administered by the Ultimate Fighting Championship. This failure not only put a damper on his triumphant return to the octagon, but also cast a shadow over his professional wrestling career and raised questions about the integrity of WWE's wellness policy. The case of Brock Lesnar presented a unique and challenging scenario. When UFC announced that Lesnar had been temporarily suspended for violating their drug policy, so you saw it, tested him, he tested clean for a bunch of them, and then he tested um, positive for the one that was like, I think, three weeks out of the fight. There was the other one that he tested for post-fight. Vince McMahon and WWE found themselves in a precarious position. Lesnar being contracted to both companies had his violation occurred under the banner of mixed martial arts rather than pro wrestling. 
WWE's silence on the matter was deafening and controversial. The company chose to not suspend Lesnar, a decision that left fans and observers questioning the consistency and integrity of the wellness policy. This apparent double standard suggested that Lesnar was, in some respects, bulletproof when it came to enforcement of WWE's drug testing protocols. The implications of WWE and Vince McMahon's decision, or lack thereof, reverberated through its relationship with both Dana White, the president of UFC, and Vince McMahon, WWE's chairman. For Dana White and UFC, Lesnar's failed test was a black eye on the organisation, especially considering the high profile of Lesnar's return to MMA and the attention it had drawn from fans and the media. UFC's swift action to suspend Lesnar aligned with their strict stance on drug violations, highlighting a commitment to clean competition. Conversely, Vince McMahon and WWE's handling of the situation painted an altogether different picture. By not suspending Lesnar, WWE risked the credibility of its WWE wellness policy and faced criticism for perceived favoritism towards its biggest stars. This decision could be seen as a calculated move by McMahon, prioritising the draw and profitability of a superstar like Lesnar over the strict enforcement of company policy. The rivalry between Brock Lesnar and Braun Strowman has been marked by its competitive edge both in both in the ring and behind the scenes, embodying a narrative that blurs the lines between scripted entertainment and genuine animosity, something that we've seen time and time again through Lesnar's career. This relationship, fraught with tension, begun to publicly unravel during their encounter at the 2016 Royal Rumble, setting the stage for a series of confrontations that would captivate and perplex fans and insiders alike. Working with Brock, I go in with the mentality that it's a real fight, you have to. I remember Royal Rumble a couple of years ago, I got a little ants in my pants, so did he, and we threw some heavy hitters at each other and carried on from there. Fans speculating about a possible real life rift. Let's face it, Brock's one of the baddest human beings on the planet, and I enjoy it, I like the physical aspect of it. I didn't get into this thinking it was water polo or tennis or anything like that. I knew this was a full contact sport, and when you're in the ring with Brock Lesnar, it is full contact. Ask anybody that's worked with him, Brock brings the big fight and that's why people pay money to see him. However, it was seemingly their match at no mercy that laid bare the complexities of their relationships. Tasked with competing for the Universal title, the encounter was poised to be a marquee event, pitting WWE's hottest big star with the biggest special attraction that they had. Yet the match failed to deliver on its immense potential. Critics and fans alike deemed the bout lacklustre, akin to a phoned-in house show match, rather than the epic battle it was expected to be. Lesnar's apparent disinterest in elevating Strowman's stature within the narrative, possibly a lingering effect from their two Royal Rumble interactions, resulted in a performance that diminished Strowman's momentum rather than solidifying his place as a dominant force. This speculation was further fueled by their subsequent encounter two years later, again at the Royal Rumble in 2018, where tensions escalated into physicality with Lesnar delivering a stiff punch to Strowman's head. This act of aggression reportedly a retaliatory measure for a knee strike from Strowman that Lesnar had found excessively forceful underscored the brutal reality of their rivalry. I like the feeling of going out there and humiliating somebody. If you step on the mat with me, it means you think you can beat me, and I like destroying that. Brock Lesnar's match against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 34 held in New Orleans. The main event saw Lesnar defending the Universal Championship against long-term rival Reigns, and the WWE's narrative direction was clear. Reigns was positioned as the company's top babyface, the hero set to dethrone Lesnar, the seemingly invincible champion. However, the reception from the New Orleans crowd did not follow the script that WWE had hoped to write. Instead of rallying behind Reigns, the live audience turned on the match, expressing their disapproval with boos and negative chants. This adverse reaction was indicative of a larger sentiment, with a segment of WWE's fanbase at the time which had grown weary of Reigns' push as the company's leading figure. Despite the high stakes and intense physicality of the match, the crowd's poor reaction overshadowed the athlete's efforts. Lesnar ultimately emerged victorious, retaining the Universal Championship, but the outcome was marred by the audience's response. The tension and frustration that simmered during the match spilled over backstage a moment captured with raw authenticity in the WWE 24 special looking back at WrestleMania 34. Vince McMahon got his checkbook out and he's writing more checks, but I have a limit and we're at that limit right now. 
and I am not caught up into it like maybe I'm supposed to be. I approach this as, I'm a skilled worker. I clock in, I clock out. People pay to watch me, and by chance, I guess they find me entertaining. When I look back, and what I'm proud of is the money in my bank account. In recent times, the world of professional wrestling and mixed martial arts has been shaken to its very core by a series of allegations that have not only cast a shadow over individual careers, but have also threatened to reshape the landscape of these industries. Central to this upheaval is Brock Lesnar, a figure synonymous with dominance and controversy in equal measure. Lesnar's storied career, marked by unparalleled achievements across WWE, has encountered a significant roadblock following a bombshell report that implicates him in a scandal of grave proportions. The controversy emerged from a lawsuit filed by Janelle Grant, a former employee of WWE, initially against Vince McMahon, the company's former executive chairman, and John Laurinaitis, the former head of talent relations. The lawsuit accuses both McMahon and Laurinaitis of sexually abusing Grant. Furthermore, it alleges McMahon of sharing explicit photos and videos of Grant under distressing circumstances with an unnamed wrestler, later identified by the Wall Street Journal as Brock Lesnar. The revelation has had immediate and profound repercussions for Lesnar's career. Reportedly, he was removed from the prestigious Royal Rumble event in 2024, and rumours abound, suggesting that his return to the wrestling ring might be indefinitely postponed. Sources hint at the possibility of Lesnar's absence extending for a considerable duration, a development that not only affects his withstanding within WWE, but also precludes any potential return to the UFC, given that both organisations now fall under the purview of the TKO group. The overarching narrative coming from the company is one of a concerted effort to dissociate from the controversies that have tarnished both Brock Lesnar and Vince McMahon's legacy. The implications of this scandal extend beyond individual careers, signalling a potential overhaul within WWE's internal structure. Ari Emanuel, CEO of the TKO Group, is reportedly considering a clean house strategy for those closely associated with Vince McMahon, a move that could spell the very end for figures historically dubbed as Vince Guys. This strategic pivot underscores a broader intent to purge the negative associations left in McMahon and Lesnar's wake, with Lesnar's future hanging in the balance. In July 2021, the suit said that McMahon instructed Grant to create personalised sexual content for a WWE superstar that he was trying to re-sign. The suit didn't name the professional wrestler, but described as both a UFC fighter and WWE talent. People familiar with the matter identified the wrestler as Brock Lesnar, one of WWE's biggest names. Lesnar didn't immediately respond Thursday to requests for comment. The suit said McMahon shared the explicit photos with the star and informed Grant that he likes what he sees. After the stars agreed to a new WWE contract, McMahon texted Grant in August 2021 to say that part of the deal was effing you. That December, McMahon gave Grant personal cell phone number to the WWE star, the lawsuit said. The wrestler asked her to send a video of herself urinating, the suit said, and after she did, he called her a bitch. That same month, the suit said, the star expressed a desire to set a play date, but a snowstorm disrupted his travel plans. Lesnar's predicament is emblematic of a larger crisis that has engulfed WWE. Following allegations of sex trafficking against Vince McMahon involving former employee Janelle Grant, the lawsuit, detailed over 67 pages, alleges McMahon of forcing Grant into exploitative situations for his own gratification and sharing explicit content without her consent. While Lesnar was not explicitly named in the lawsuit, the description of a former UFC champion whom McMahon was eager to re-sign points unmistakably towards him, further complicating the narrative with alleged exchanges of explicit content between McMahon, Grant and Lesnar. This scandal could mark a dramatic fall from grace for Lesnar, a former UFC champion, a 10-time WWE champion, a two-time Royal Rumble winner, and a five-time WrestleMania main eventer. The repercussions of this controversy could be career-defining. As the wrestling community grapples with the ramifications of these allegations, the future remains uncertain for one of the most dominant figures in the history of combat sports. The saga of Brock Lesnar, once a tale of unmatched success across multiple arenas, has taken a stark turn, leaving fans and observers alike to ponder the legacy of a titan facing his most formidable challenge yet, not in the ring, but in the court of public opinion, and potentially those halls of legal justice. 
In the high stakes world of pro wrestling, controversy is not unfamiliar, yet the recent scandal involving Lesnar and McMahon has, has sent shockwaves through the universe, potentially marking the end of an era for one of its most formidable stars. The allegations that have since emerged in 2024 have not only cast a shadow over Lesnar's career, but also raised questions about the future direction of WWE itself. The pivot point of this controversy was the decision to scrap Lesnar's highly anticipated return at the Royal Rumble, a move that signalled the gravity of the situation. Dave Meltzer, a respected figure in wrestling journalism and the creator of the Wrestling Observer newsletter, suggested that this might spell the end of Lesnar's tenure in WWE. Meltzer noted, It appears that Brock Lesnar is not going to be around for a while, some people think ever. When it comes to talent, I hate to say forever, because most of the time it's not the case, especially if somebody can draw, they seem to find a way back. This statement encapsulates the precarious situation in which Brock Lesnar finds himself caught between his undeniable draw as a performer and the severity of the scandal at hand. Adding to Lesnar's woe in the decision by WWE, licensing partner 2K to remove him from the WWE 2K Supercard mobile game, with indications that his removal from all 2K games and licensed products is forthcoming. This move mirrors actions taken against controversial figures in the past such as Chris Benoit after 2007 and Hulk Hogan for a short period highlighting the industry's readiness to distance itself from individuals embroiled in significant controversies. Mike Johnson of PWI Insider confirmed Lesnar's disappearance from the game, stating, It would appear that 2K as a licensee for WWE is following the company's lead after WWE backed off on using Lesnar last weekend at the Royal Rumble event. This decision not only reflects Lesnar's plummeting stock within the company, but also signifies a broader intent to disassociate from the negative press surrounding him. The repercussions of this scandal have extended to WWE's merchandising strategies, with WWEshop.com discounting much of Lesnar's merchandise, an act that suggests an attempt to sever ties and mitigate financial losses associated with his brand. This merchandise markdown is emblematic of a company in crisis mode seeking to navigate the fallout of a scandal that has tarnished one of its most lucrative stars. While Lesnar has himself not faced criminal charges or arrest, the investigation involving Vince McMahon by the FBI adds a layer of complexity and potential legal jeopardy that could further impede Lesnar's prospects of a return. The intertwining of Lesnar's fate with the investigation into McMahon indicates the extent to which the scandal has ensnared individuals at the highest levels of the organisation. The controversy surrounding Brock Lesnar and Vince McMahon in 2024 marks a critical juncture for the company, challenging WWE to reconcile its business imperatives with the ethical and legal ramifications of the allegations. As WWE continues to grapple with these issues, the saga of Brock Lesnar serves as a cautionary tale about the fragility of fame and the swift descent that can follow the revelation of scandal, leaving fans, commentators and industry insiders to ponder the future of one of wrestling's most iconic figures in the face of unprecedented turmoil.